Page 46, exercise 1.6. Now this piece actually has a name to it, it's for Jacques. Most of the method book, they would put the name of the piece as the title of the piece. This book does it as exercises, and it just happens to be a melody of a piece. So, in the videos, I'm going to title it as the book titles it. It's exercise 1.6, but it happens to be Frere Jacques, the melody to it. Now, I don't know that that's important or not, but there we are. So, what we're doing is we're playing the hands separately. The first line is right hand only. They have the right hand in parentheses. That's not part of the music notation. They've just stuck it in there to help you out. The second line is mostly right hand, but the last two measures are left hand, because you'll see a left hand down there it's telling you the left hand. Generally speaking, not all the time, generally speaking, if the notes are in the top staff, and the staff is those group of five lines, the top staff would be done by the right hand, right, right whatever your right hand is. And the bottom staff would be done by the left hand. Now that's not always true. There's no rule that says it has to be that way. It's just convenient that it is that way. So when we see notes in the upper staff, we just automatically want to go to the right hand first. Unless there's something in the music that tells us, no, 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 use the other hand. And we'll get there. I'll point that out when the time comes. In Frerizaka, let's talk about all these symbols, because you need to know and understand every symbol that's on that page. I'm a big believer in that. So I already told you about the staffs, the five lines, group of five lines, there's two of them. And there's vertical bars ever so often. We call those measure lines or bar lines. I think this book calls them bar lines. Depends on where you're from. It's the same thing. Because these measures can also be called bars. So I could say third bar, first line, third bar, or I could say first line, third measure. Same difference. So just know that a measure and a bar is the same thing. A measure line and a bar line is the same thing. Now at the beginning of this, of each line, in the top staff you have this curly Q thingy but jigger. That is called a treble clef or a G clef. And it's called a G clef because it points out where the note G is on the staff. And G is the line that goes right through the middle of the circle part, the lower circle part. There's a line through the middle of it. Some people, when they write out music, handwrite it, and they hand this, they're very sloppy, and they, they seem to forget that wherever that circle is, that's the G. And this staff does not move around. It's always there. So the G in this staff is always the next to the bottom line. And it tells you on the keyboard, the G is the G above middle C. Because there's a lot of G's on the keyboard. But there's only one G that matches that line. And that's this one. Well, if you know where that note is, you can figure out any of the others. And that's the way it's set up. So this first note, for instance, you have to count down from G. So G is the line, then under that is a space, that would be F. Under that is the bottom line on the staff, that was an E. And then underneath the bottom line, just underneath it, is a D. And then we get this, which is underneath that, it has a line going through it. The line going through it is like another line in the staff, temporary, it's called a ledger line. It's so we can have more notes because the five lines in a staff is not enough for all the notes that we can have. So we simply add lines above or below as we need to to get these other notes. So this first note, that C, happens to be middle C. It's an important note. Middle C on the keyboard is that line. Now it's not middle C because it's in the middle of the keyboard. It's middle C because it's in the middle of the grand staff. Well, that's wonderful. What's a grand staff? I'm getting there. 
but the, that happens to be this C. It is close to the middle of the, the middle of the keyboard is actually around the F or F sharp around in here, but C is close. And so we know where the notes are in the upper staff because of that clef. It won't always be that clef. It doesn't have to be. It can be other things. So right now it's that clef. Now on the bottom staff, it's a different symbol. It's a curved thing with two dots. This is called a bass clef or an F clef. And that is because it's telling us where the F is on the staff. And that is the line between the two dots the next to the top line. On the keyboard, the F is the F below middle C. So here's middle C, you go down to an F. And Again, if you know where that F is, you can calculate and figure out where any of the other notes are by going up and down the alphabet. Take a look on the second line, the second... Uh, each group of two staves connected together, I call one line. So if I say second line, it's the second group of staves. And I'm going to the last two measures. That's where the left hand is playing. Left, right, yeah, okay. F, according to the F clef, or bass clef, is here. That note shown is higher than that. So to figure it out, we simply count up, sort of. Start with the F, where it's at. The, the space above that line is a G. Then the top line would be an A. Then the space above that is a B. Then if you had a line, a little line, another line, that would be a C. And there are C's, the last note in each of those measures, those, that's a C. And then the space right above that is a D. You can just keep going. <laughs> and eventually you'll memorize them. I, I recommend you memorize the notes up to at least three of those ledger lines above or below each staff. Eventually. Work on them. You got to memorize these notes first. You should be able to just look at that note in the music and know exactly what the name of the note is and where it is on the keyboard. And until you can do that, don't be in a hurry to keep going through the book. We need to learn this first. So that first note in the left hand is a D. The D right above middle C. And then you can figure out the next note and then you get there from there. Just work these out one at a time. It will take some time and effort to learn to read the music. But it will come. And that's the bass clef. Now, going back to the beginning of these lines, I say both lines, I mean, they're the same. You have two lines in this exercise. The, the two steps up above and the two steps down, each one is a line. The beginning is the same of each one, if you look at it, except the top one has a 4-4 and the bottom one doesn't. Well, look at the top one. You have the bar that connects them, and then you have this curly brace in front of them. That brace is important because it's that brace that identifies this whole setup of these two staffs and all as a grand staff. Now that's important. Most all keyboard instruments, whatever they are, use a grand staff. The clefs can change, the, the numbers can change, the sharps and flats can change, but the one th single vertical line and that curly brace at the beginning that should be there for a keyboard instrument. Not for other instruments. We're just talking piano right now. Now, the 4-4. Four, four. Well, there's counting in music. Good luck. The top number tells you how far to count. Another way of saying it is how many beats or how many counts are in a measure or a bar. How many are in a bar? How many are in a measure? Well, that's telling you there's four. The bottom note is telling you what you're counting. Helps to know. And the four represents quarter, as in one-fourth, a quarter of something. So they're referring to a quarter note. Well, these notes in the first measure in the right hand there at the beginning of this are all quarter notes. That's what a quarter note looks like. And you see there's four of them. Well, that works out then because there should be four of them. So when we count it, we would go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You just keep repeating that over and over. And each of those numbers represents a quarter note. Well, you look over on the third major over, third and fourth, the last note in it is a hollow note with a stem. That is a half note. Well, two quarter notes to a half, two quarters to a half. Well, so a half note is equal to two quarter notes. Or in this case, it's equal to two counts or two beats. So you're going to hold it down for two beats. And that's how this works. 
So having said all that, let's try this really slowly together. We'll play it together. I'm going to count us in. I'm going to give us four counts. I'm going to go one, two, ready, go, and then we start. And we'll play it. You play it with me, and you listen to the note you're playing. Listen to the note I'm playing, and make sure they're the same note. They should sound the same. If they don't, you got a wrong note, and that tells you you're, you're, something's wrong here. And you need to play them at the same time I'm playing them. So you're counting correctly right there. Now, when we get to the, I want to do both lines, just you finish the first line and go immediately go to the second. So we do the whole thing as just one piece, because that's the way it's written. And when you get to the second line, in the first couple of measures, you'll see they put in eighth notes. Good grief. An eighth note, it it's a, looks like a quarter note, but it's got this beam going across. Some people call those bars. It's confusing when they have a bar here and a bar here, whatever. So we'll call them beams here. And it's two eighth notes to a quarter. Two eighths equal a quarter. Well, when you're counting eighth notes, you've got to have something representing the middle of the beat. Because if it's a quarter is one, two, three, four, I need something in between to represent two notes for each of those numbers. So I put in the word and in between them, and I go one and, two and, three and, four and. And each of those represents an eighth note in four, four times. Demonstrate the first line, the first measure of the first line on the quarter notes. It would be a one, two, three, four, one, two, etc. Well, the second line with the eighth notes, it's a one and two and three and, but the numbers are going to be the same speed. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three, and that's how the eighth note works. Fun. So you got to make sure you're playing your notes at the same time I'm playing mine to make sure we have the rhythm correctly. The rhythm is, you know, the long short of the notes and how when a note is played and ugh. So the question is where the hands go because the hands could go anywhere. Well, they go where the music tells them to go. Here at the beginning, they give you the finger numbers, the little numbers above them. Just putting your thumb on middle C. And so this is your hand position for the first line. Now look at the second line. You have the G, but your fourth finger's on it. So your hand's got to go up one key here. So you can get those here. But look at the last note in that measure of the second line. The, the C, my, my hand, thumb's on a D. So I gotta move the thumb down to get the C. I'm not moving the hand, I'm moving the hand where it's at. I'm just the thumb. And that's how that's done. So your hands can move around a little bit. Then the left hand, when it comes in, it wants the thumb on that D right above middle C, this one. And that's where it's gonna go. Well, that's interesting because you're here in the right hand, and now they want here in the left hand, and they're in each other's way, sort of. So, what you do is you can leave the left hand out of it for a while. You might just put maybe a few fingers on it just to anchor it where it goes, if you want. Then when you get there, when you play the last note in the right hand, the C, then reach up and be ready to play the D in the left hand. And when you do, you can take your right hand away. You're done. Normally I tell the, my viewers to keep both hands on the keyboard throughout the piece when you're beginning. But the way they've written this, that makes it awkward to do that. So we can't really do that too well. Now look at the last note in the first line. It's a half note G with fifth finger. Look at the next note. That is the first note in the second line. That is an eighth note G with fourth finger. This is why your hand has to move up one. You're here. Now you got to go to here. And you have to do it in rhythm. So the half note is like three, 
four, and then you just quickly go up. One and two, and so you're ready. You just move up. You look down at the keyboard if you have to. Eventually, you want to be able to feel moving up and down one key without looking at it. Eventually. Now, I will encourage you, learn it first, and when you think you've got it, then play it with me, and don't go on until you can play it accurately with me. And it wouldn't hurt to learn to play it a little faster than we're playing. I'm keeping it really slow on purpose. You can speed it up on your own afterward, after you know it. So go ahead and put your right hand where it goes. And I'm going to go ahead and put the, the three fingers of the left hand here to anchor them. So they're there. And we're ready to go. I'll give us four counts. One, two, ready. Go. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four. Four, one, two, three, four.